He has written more than 1,700 stories, dazzling readers with mind-bending works of fantasy. His television shows have transported audiences to where no man has gone before. Hong Snow! This man's name is Harlan Ellison. I'm God! Don't mess with me! Brace yourself for some dangerous visions. The Sci-Fi Channel presents a look inside the creative mind of Harlan Ellison, a master of fantasy. Most writers are shy creatures. They labor in obscurity, silently translating thoughts and dreams into written words. Harlan Ellison is not one of those writers. I love to write. I just love to write. When I sit down at the typewriter, man, I just, I'm like Nemo at the pipe organ. I just sit there and say, all right, do it. When I hear writers complain about, oh, oh it's such hard work, uh, you know, you people ought to be out digging ditches, for God's sakes. Quiet, soft-spoken, timid, shy. You think you're the guy you're the guy I'm just, I'll tell you. After spending two or three hours in his company, I have to go lie down for a while. Get out of here. Beat it. A Borspell comic trapped in the body of a great science fiction writer. How many leprechaun nuns do you have here in the order? He's the most refreshing, honest, direct, unequivocal, specific, verbal, shy person I've ever known. I have won more awards than anybody else in the field. And I say that with absolutely no humility. Nobody gave me anything. I worked my ass off to get those awards. See, as you can clearly tell, I am not the world's most lovable guy. So for me to win an award means the work has got to be really great. Ellison talks the talk, but he also walks the walk. With 74 books and 1,700 short stories, this essays, and articles one. to his credit, he's one of the most prolific writers in the world. If I were a plumber and I had, and I had fixed 10,000 toilets, would you say I'm a prolific plumber? It's what I do. I'm a writer. And not just any writer. Ellison's extraordinary fiction elegantly combines elements of mystery, drama, and fantasy, shattering the boundaries of imaginative literature. He does with life what Picasso did with images, in a way, you know? He's almost a literary cubist. I have no mouth and I must scream. What an extraordinary piece of writing. Extraordinary. He takes you into a world and creates a, a condition uh, so powerfully uh, expressed on the page that it becomes a physical experience reading it. I have no mouth and I must scream was, in a sense, the first cyberspace story. There's, there's a very interesting blurring of the interior with the exterior in that story. You ain't pulling that crap on me again. And you can shove that part about how you lost the ability to hunt for food when you learned how to talk. I mean, you don't realize what a boon it is to be able to create all these characters, to create all these worlds, and people actually think I'm worth something. I mean, here you are sitting here doing a show about me. Boy, have I got you suckers fooled. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with your television set. Do not attempt to adjust the picture. Ellison has been equally successful writing for television, but his relationship with Hollywood, where even the greatest writers are often rewritten, has been a contentious one. He believes that the vision of the original creator has to be respected, that that's the fount of all creativity and that to mess with it is, uh, is sinful. And he has expressed that privately, publicly, in writing, on camera, uh, lunging across uh, lunch tables at executives and in just about any way that you can think. They're doing what they always do, using details to distract us from doing what must be done. They do not understand the primacy of interest of the creator. The writer creates it, not the actor, not the director, not the people who read it. The writer is the one who creates it. Harlan's policy is that you will treat what I write with respect. And if you give him the respect that his work requires, there is not a problem. Well, he's a very understanding person. He understands the process. He just won't put up with it. Harlan's friend Robin Williams has often witnessed the author's short fuse. You know, his tolerance for stupidity is, you know, but cellophane thin. And people will say something stupid. That's insane. That's stupid. You're a moron. 
You proved to me that Darwin was wrong. Harlan, no, come on, he's a priest. Let go of him. This guy writes me and he says, I am three foot tall and we don't like being called midgets. We like being called little people. Ellison's take no prisoners attitude has made him a popular television guest. In fact, in recent years, he has become as famous for his caustic commentaries as for his literary accomplishments. And finally, I wrote him back a letter and I said, Dear Mr. Johnson, I am five foot five. I'm a little person. You're a midget. Harlan's opinions have been voiced on such diverse programs as Sci-Fi Buzz, Politically Incorrect, and The Late Late Show with Tom Snyder. Please welcome my good friend, Mr. Harlan Ellison. I'm blacker than O.J. Simpson. He's the whitest dude I know, for God's sakes. I'm a big mouth. I'm a guy who runs his face, and, and, and that's just another place to do it. And, uh, and, and here, here I am given a, 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 a national, perhaps international, platform from which to say a few reasonable things. My philosophy of life has always been anything that is not nailed down is mine. And right. anything I can pry loose is not nailed down. <laughs> While Ellison's television commentaries have been known to cause a stir, his personal appearances are even more memorable. One of his favorite undertakings is to craft an original short story in public. It is a great pleasure to do because it shows people that writing is a human job, that it's not some mystical trick that only a few people can do, but it's also a trick that you have to have talent to be able to do. These stories are written in bookstore windows, and often a celebrity contributes an opening word, phrase, or idea to prove that Harlan is starting from scratch. I came up with about a hundred clever ideas, uh, all of which I discarded because I realized I wanted to leave the cleverness to the, to the writer here. So this is to get this event started, X-Files creator Chris Carter has shown up and made a particularly challenging suggestion. You're a, you're a terrible man. It says the 102-year-old pregnant corpse. Within seconds, Ellison begins work on the story, two fingers hammering away on his manual typewriter at 120 words a minute. Manual typewriter produces work at the speed and in the degree that I prefer. I don't like the PC. I don't like what the copy looks like. I like the fact that if I hit an S key, the S appears on the paper. It is my connection to my work. They asked me to come and give him the suggestion, and I gave him the suggestion of a, uh, a computer vampire, the bite that bites. And he said, you know, screw you, I don't know anything about computers. And he wrote a story. No matter what the subject, Ellison conducts his spontaneous symphony, and pages are pasted in the store window as they are completed. This is real time. This is happening right now. To actually see the writing process going on, you know, or to see him work, actually, it's, it, <laughs> the words can't describe it. Amazingly, a few hours later, the story is finished. While the crowd reads the results in the window, the author gracefully claims victory. That devilish jackanapes Chris Carter thought he had me stumped. 102-year-old pregnant corpse indeed. Ha, ha, I have you, Carter. I have you. <laughs> Harlan Ellison has dangerous vision. A human being. Harlan Ellison is a unique voice in American literature. In both his books and his commentaries, he always creates a stir. I look at the species. I just look at the species. And some days I think we should just turn it over to the cockroaches and to hell with it, you know? And Ellison's life has been every bit as captivating. Born in Cleveland and raised in Painesville, Ohio, he didn't wait long to begin what would be a lifetime of adventure and controversy. I ran away from home first time when I was 13. Uh, I wasn't abused, I had a wonderful family, but uh, I just uh, knew that the world was mine if I could just go out there and find it. Toby Tyler or Ten Weeks with a Circus, which is a famous children's book, and I had read it, and this kid runs away and joins a circus. And uh, so I did too, and I ran away, but I couldn't find a circus, but I did find a carnival. Allison was soon returned to his parents, but he had tasted the outside world. A few years later, he attended Ohio State University and was quickly frustrated by traditional academia. So I had this college professor who told me I had no talent. You'll, you'll never be able to write. And if you continue to write, if you continue to bat your, your, your wings against the window like a moth, uh, he said, you, you will be frustrated. And I punched him. I hit him. I hit him very hard. This was not the school's accepted form of student-teacher feedback. And Ellison was told he was no longer welcome at Ohio State. I sat around for about, oh, about three, four months, and then I went to New York got myself some jobs and I started writing and I sold two stories the first year and 110 stories the second year and I've been doing it ever since. Ellison's brash and innovative fiction and his equally brash personal style instantly attracted young readers like future cyberpunk icon William Gibson. 
I noticed that there was this guy who wrote science fiction, but he would also turn up like in, in Playboy and Esquire, and he would like actually be wearing a cool jacket. He was, the, he was this crossover guy, and he was like a science fiction writer, but he was really hip, too. Fantasists are special kinds of dreamers. Uh, their minds come from someplace else, their thoughts are someplace else, they deal with this oneness with the cosmos. Ellison Starr rose quickly, and in 1967, his landmark anthology, Dangerous Visions, exploded on the literary scene. You didn't see any stories about black people, you didn't see any stories by women, you didn't see stories about labor relations, or sex, or, uh, or religion. So I said, I really would like to edit a book that is filled with stories that are so offbeat, so dangerous, that no magazine would touch them. When Dangerous Visions came out, it, Harlan had a, this wonderful kind of uh, 